Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Necessary Aptitude, a memoir by Pam Ayres. So Pam Ayres is a poet. Uh, we do have a little blurb, so I'm going to read the blurb to you. Then I'm going to go through it and start checking out my tabs, and then I'll share my thoughts and rating at the end. I'm only about 60 pages in at the moment, page 62 of about 400. So um, yeah, I'll be updating this review over the coming days, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun with this one. So, Dane reads... Pam Ayres' early childhood in Stamford in the Vale was idyllic in many ways, and typical of that experience by a great swathe of children born in rural areas in the immediate post-war years. Biggie! Though her parents' generation was harrowed by war, better times were coming. Everything the family needed was within walking distance in the village, and life with four older brothers and a sister in their crowded council house was exceedingly lively. In her late teens, Pam grew dissatisfied with her life as a civil service clerk with only the local hop for scintillating excitement. Having seen three of her brothers called up for national service and sent off to exciting destinations, Pam felt desperate for travel and adventure. She joined the WRAF and soon found herself in the Far East. There she began to write in earnest and develop the unique talent that would make her one of Britain's favourite comics. Written with Pam's much-loved combination of humour and poignancy, The Necessary Aptitude is a beautifully written memoir of her early years. And so I thought this was just, it was quite moving and, and sad as well. It's a, a sort of a testament to the times. Um, so um, she, uh, she got pregnant, so her independence, uh, this is her mum, sorry. Her independence was cut short when she became pregnant by my father and was hastily married in a sad anonymous church in Oxford. The, the attaching shame at that time was such that in our home, their wedding anniversary was never mentioned or celebrated in any way. And here she writes about her mother, and I just thought this was quite, again, quite touching, and just shows how badass, is, how badass mums are. Opposite the window stood a kitchen table, which was never out of use. Upon it stood the suitcase-like bulk of our brown wooden wireless, and here every day mum worked on a vast variety of household chores. She rolled out great grey boulders of pastry, stirred up gargantuan one-egg currant cakes, bottled fruit into kilner jars and sealed down innumerable pots of homemade jam as dark protective jewels for the winter. At this table she dished up colossal meals every day and, at night before she went to bed, she used it to saw up more loaves to make packed lunches for the men to take to work in the morning. She never stopped working and I'm sorry to say that I took her entirely for granted. I was used to seeing her stagger across the kitchen with great wrist cracking brown saucepans full of cooked vegetables shouting warningly, boiling water, boiling water. Every day I watched her back out of the stiflingly hot cupboard where she fried, roasted, baked and boiled on our bandy-legged jacks and electric cooker. She would be drenched in sweat and red in the face, her dark hair tied up in a scarf because she so hated it to smell of fat. Most mornings she would pedal off down to the village shops on her bike, returning unsteadily with heavy bags crowded onto the handlebars. On Monday she would be wrestling the hard flapping sheets on and off the clothesline. Buckets of grey water and bowls of soaking garments cluttered the kitchen floor, and the whole scene would be permeated by the immediate immediately recognisable and unlovely smell of wash day. At any other time she might be energetically mashing up food for the chickens, cleaning windows, top and tailing gooseberries, knitting jumpers, peeling heaps of apples and mud cake potatoes, or making beds with one hand wrenching back the sheets and the other clutching a bar of soap for pouncing on fleas. I never expected her to be ill and she never was apart from once. I watched her work year in, year out, doing the endless round of chores, and it never once occurred to me that she might have wanted some other life, some tiny bit of freedom for herself. The only problem that with that is the use of the word warningly, an unnecessary adverb there. And uh, she, she writes about Christmas, she says, I remember Christmas at Camp Dean in a series of little scenes. There was always somebody dolefully saying, well, it don't feel a bit like Christmas to me, which I hated because I wanted it to feel like Christmas, to have the magic it was supposed to have. However, I've since found that no Christmas ever goes by without this unwelcome utterance from somebody or other. It's normally me saying that. She talks about condoms, uh, they were euphemistically called French letters. And uh, here she's talking about toilets. I just think it's interesting again to see how much times have changed, you know? Up their garden they had a pleasant pale wooden lavatory. Ivy had inveigled its way through the slats. In contrast to our lavatory, theirs was very smart. Few families had toilet paper. Everyone used newspaper, it was only the presentation that differed. Gran cut her newspapers up into squares and neatly threaded a string through one corner. These were then hung up discreetly and conveniently on a little interior nail. At Camp Dean, ours was pretty much as it came off the press. Whole newspapers were strewn across the wide seat and concrete floor. It was just a question of ripping off the quantity required to both clean the bottom and simultaneously blacken it with newsprint. So I just thought this was an interesting little thing again. I've heard of people doing this, but it's very much an old school thing. Auntie Dorothy owned interesting things. In a cupboard above their fireplace, she had plats in a box. 
They were her own plaits, thick braids of perfect blonde hair lying wrapped in tissue paper in a shoebox. I remember a feeling of distaste as I looked at them, a worrying sense of amputation, of something morbid that should still have been attached to somebody. It seemed to have been quite common, this cutting off and keeping of particularly good hair. Perhaps it was a coming of age ritual, a sign of growing up. Girls either kept it all their lives like Auntie Dorothy, or used it as an insurance against hard times when they could sell it to wig makers. And we get this as well, which again I just find interesting because I'm interested in the darker side of humanity. There were only a very few unsavoury presences in the village. Whenever a crowd of girls played on the green in front of Camp Dean, one big boy always lay in the longer grass and invited the girls over beside him. He had something to show them, he said. He never offered to show it to me. Another older man was more menacing. Soft-spoken and cultured, he charmed the mothers into letting him take their little daughters out and about. He took the mothers in. They thought he was so delightful and so kind to the children. They would have been less charmed to see him when he had the little girls to himself. None of those so trustingly handed over to him were harmed, but I remember him with profound disquiet. He was silkily manipulative, and we were most certainly at risk. And uh, she was learning to ride on horseback, and then the person she learned, was learning from got thrown from the back of her boyfriend's motorbike, and... Um, ended up in a wheelchair, but she was treated at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, which is my local hospital. We have some uh, images in this as well, and I particularly like the caption. So this one here says, me beside a large trout hanging on the washing line. I am the one with the perm. Yes, you are, Pam. Glad for that little clarification there. She went to see Roger Bannister run his four minute mile. Um, and I used to date somebody who lived just down the road of that Cowley way in Oxford. Um, so I used to walk past where he did that quite a lot. She says, uh, talking about books and stuff, the, the library was housed on one bookshelf presided over by Miss Edmonds who greeted me in a friendly fashion and asked about my interests. She chose two books for me, both of which I would love and remember for life. One was Black Beauty by Anna Sewell and the other Just William by Richmond Crompton. These were real crafted stories and hugely potent. One made me cry, one made me laugh and both whetted my appetite for more. Miss Edmonds handing me those two books was a simple act of immeasurable significance. This is why you should give books to kids. And she talks about uh, having music lessons and being put off music because of the music teacher. Which a similar thing happened to me at secondary school as well. Music as taught by Mrs Thomas was a different proposition altogether. She dealt in minims and crotchets. A stave and clef appeared on the blackboard and a large question mark appeared over the top of my head. I couldn't grasp it. I did years later, but then I appeared but nothing came through the fog. Mrs Thomas had a short fuse. One day she asked me what notes went into a certain bar. I had not a clue. Two minims and a semi-quaver, I ventured. She made me stand up. How on earth could you possibly have arrived at that, she bawled, red in the face and blazing with anger. I felt my interest in music clutch its throat and die of shame. Yeah, there was a lot of, like, that sort of pompousness in the music department of my school. It was a miracle that I ended up learning to play guitar, but it was nothing to do with school. And in fact, I still have a healthy distrust of sheet music and proper music lessons because of my experience of music at secondary school. And we get the phrase necessary aptitude, which is obviously the title of the memoir. So I'm just gonna read this paragraph out here. It was 1960 and I was not doing well at school. I shone at nothing. In art, I decided to craft a monumental head and having failed to stick the wet, heavy plaster of Paris onto the flimsy wire frame, I lost interest and instead used it to fill up Jeanette Weaver's fur lined gloves. Not unreasonably, Jeanette Weaver was indignant and I was sent to the headmaster for a wigging. He suggested I try the other creative art since possibly, as far as sculpture was concerned, I lacked the necessary aptitude. Okay, so this was really sad. Um, and this, I think is a, re I wanted to read this out because this is a really good argument for why you should get your pets neutered. Um, so she says, therefore it was a mind numbing development when dad himself led home a dog on a length of string. Even the kindest observer could not have called her attractive. She was brindled with strange stripes, large and bony. It appeared that Dad had been working for the electricity board on a farm near the village of Appleton when she was a puppy dog. She had taken a fancy to him and followed him around everywhere, bumbling along at his heels. Now he had gone back to the same farm and found the family packing up and moving away. The puppy, now grown up, was going to be put down. Dad couldn't face the thought of it, and to everyone's incredulity and my ecstatic delight, he brought her home to Van Diemen's Road. I named her Judy, like Mr. Howard's nice dog at Camp Dean, and she was installed in a large kennel, which Dad built and duly creosoted in the back garden. All was fine and dandy until a few weeks later when it became clear that she was pregnant. She developed fulsome teats along the undercarriage and carefully made herself a large nest. I sat in the kennel with her as the puppies were born and handed them up to her at the front end to be licked and fussed over. I was enchanted. Twelve puppies later, I had misgivings and feared that my delight might not be matched by mum's. 
This proved to be indeed the case. She was horrified and put forward the unreasonable view that it would be impossible to keep 13 dogs at number 16. We had a great tearful row in the garden, mum with a shopping bag to put the puppies in to be taken down to the vet to be put to sleep and me defending them all. In the end I had to accept the inevitable and we tried tearfully to figure out which were boys and which were girls. Neither of us had much idea which little bobble signified male or female, but in the end a selection was made and mum took the tragic shopping bag full to the vet. It was terribly upsetting, I hated mum and refused to see her point of view. And uh, just this seems like a really harsh way to sober someone up. That night my brother Alan, having drunk too much beer, performed a solo highland fling up and down the length of the institute to raucous shouts and catcalls. My other brothers helped him outside and tenderly pushed him into the stinging that was to sober him up. And again another little passage on what it, what it meant to be pregnant outside of marriage at that time. Unfortunately, passion itself was not something we could afford to enjoy. The risk of coming a cropper was too great, the results too grim and far-reaching. Girls were chased through fear of the consequences of pregnancy outside marriage. Though the thought of sex was dark and thrilling, we had none of the courage required to indulge. The impact of becoming pregnant while unmarried is hard to overstate. It was a bombshell, a catastrophe. The girl and her family were shamed. They fell from grace and became the target of whispers, sniggering and ridicule. An unbelievable double standard operated as she became the subject of scorn, particularly from men. She was in trouble, or in the family way. She had been eating new bread. She had a bun in the oven. She was up the duff, up the stick, soiled linen. It was acceptable to say these things because she had forfeited her reputation, her respectability, and so too had her family. This is just a very awkwardly written sentence. I don't like adverbs anyway, but this is also in um, passive voice. So, cunningly to Miss Gunn's emporium, we would go to buy sanitary towels. Oh, don't like that sentence. And not because of the sanitary towels, I have no problem. Sanitary, sanitary towels, it's passive voice that gets me, gets me going. She uh, used to work with computers and she basically had to input like uh, lengths, widths and quantities of items. And um, she goes, one day a request came in for a gross of countersunk head screws. The width was quoted but not the length and the punch card operators needed both. Armed with a voucher I visited an adjoining office that seemed to be staffed mainly by old soldiers. I shyly approached one of them and uttered the deathless words, excuse me but could you give me a length? The old soldier choked on his tea and his eyes rounded with joy. Turning to his colleague, he spluttered, Here, Frank, this gala, she wants me to give her a length. They rocked back and forth with laughter and tears squeezed out of their roomy eyes. I stood gormlessly by, clutching my voucher and burning with shame. Uh, she ended going. She went to a day release course at the Oxford College of Further Education, an unprepossessing, prefabricated looking building far up the Cowley Road on the outskirts of the city. So that's near where Roger Bannister did his, uh, his four minute mile and where my ex-girlfriend used to live. So I used to walk along the Cowley Road. Nice around there. And she got told uh, that she lacked the necessary aptitude again. The now familiar words. She said, uh, I bought my first LP or long playing record, the freewheeling Bob Dylan, and looked jealously at the pretty long haired girl clutching his arm on the cover. And here she writes about um, the f her first trip to a Chinese restaurant because they sort of started popping up around the countryside. And this is what happened when uh, her brother Tony takes her mum there. They had their meal and Tone smoked a fag, after which they stood up and made their way to the counter to pay. Hearing shouts behind them, they spun round to see that a Chinese waiter was angrily brandishing a blazing tablecloth and shouting that Tone's discarded cigarette had caused the incineration of the fine linen cloth. That would be five pound, thank you very much. Shamefaced, though unconvinced of his guilt, Tone paid up. Naturally, this incident completely ruined the little treat. However, in conversation with his mates at a later date, he was stunned to be told the same story. In the same restaurant, it seemed that his mate had unwittingly set the tablecloth on fire, while he had been made to pay five pound in compensation. The two men gaped at each other as the outrageous truth dawned. They had been done, trussed up like a turkey. And uh, then she uh, joined, uh, what was it called? Uh, she became like a female um, air officer thing. Um, and during their training, they had to take off their masks and be exposed to tear gas, which they still do today, but like in like Royal Marines training and stuff. And um, I think this is kind of what they do as well. She says, I I'm sure it was all carefully managed as some laid down way of forming a disparate group of people into a functioning team. First, those in authority were horrible to us, which made us band together. Then bit by bit, the figures in authority grew kinder, which made us like them. Then treats and privileges were gradually added to lighten the mix. Also, momentously, we had stopped being at the bottom of the heap. On first arriving, we could see several other intake groups who were better at everything than we were. They could march, they could run, they knew the ropes. Now, to our shameful joy, we could see nervous new girls getting off the same bus from the railway station. New intakes as bewildered, as crucified by homesickness as we had been. How timid and uncertain they looked, standing in their sea of scuffed suitcases. We felt superior and made sure we looked down our noses at them. And so, um, she went 
to like live at RAF uh, or Bram Brampton and, and Bassingburn. She says, my first conversation was with two older girls who were sitting on one of the beds. They were pouring quinine from a bottle into a teaspoon. Intrigued, I went over to have a look. Seeing that it was quinine and as naive and gullible as ever, I was quick to warn them. Did they know, I asked earnestly, that in some quarters quinine was taken in order to get rid of a pregnancy? Their eyes widened with mock surprise. No, they exclaimed, surely not that, it couldn't be. And there they were, thinking it was for bad feet. They chortled together and turned back to their measuring. It never once occurred to me that they might be taking it to abort a baby. And she ends up getting a job working on Matt. She says, for the next four years, this saddled me with a job where, most decidedly, in what was becoming a hauntingly familiar phrase, I, na I lacked the necessary aptitude. And she got engaged and she didn't want to marry the guy. And she says, for some reason I have long forgotten, we were walking along the A1 beside continuous thundering traffic. It was wet, filthy spray was being thrown up from the highway. Over the deafening racket, the conversation went like this. I'm afraid I don't want to marry you. I want to call it off. If you don't marry me, I will jump out in front of the next lorry. Oh, all right, then I'll marry you. On, that sh on this shaky basis, the relationship was lurching forwards when the RAF unwittingly intervened and my fiancé was posted to RAF Cormaxar in Aden. The engagement died a troubled and lingering death. I felt chastened by the experience and was genuinely sorry for the whole episode, but the longed for freedom was intoxicating. At 18 years of age, I should never have relinquished it, but I'd been low and lonely, my judgement clouded. It's because that was what was the done thing back in those days. So here she talks about this freak accident that happened while she was in Singapore. She says, One day a freak accident livened up the daily routine. My friend Christine, who was a brilliant draftswoman and given all the jobs, had a crown front tooth. While strolling down the red tiled floor of the office, she unfortunately tripped over the flappy sandals we were issued with and embedded her front teeth in the bare knee of an unsuspecting shorts-wearing airman as he sat studiously at his desk. Though Christine extricated her teeth from his knee, it was observed that the crown remained embedded. It was later removed in hospital. Mmm, ouch. It's not no fun for her mouth either. She talks about durian ice cream. Uh, durian is like the world's foulest smelling uh, fruit. And I just thought this was interesting, it helps to set the time and place, she says. One savvy trader had organised a supply of Mary Quant cosmetics, which we young women flocked to buy. It was the swinging 60s, the era of Twiggy and the Rolling Stones. We might have been in the Far East, but we didn't want to be laggardly where fashion was concerned, so we sported the iconic Quant flower design on our makeup and ordered daring mini dresses from the tailor. And this is always fun, she's talking about VD, so she says... A particular minibus took patients suffering from venereal diseases to a specialised clinic at one of the major military hospitals. None of the men wanted to be seen on the bus because their condition would immediately become public knowledge and, awaiting them at their journey's end, was the agonising treatment, which, I was informed but never chose to verify, involved the urethral dilator, an umbrella-like scraper device which was inserted into the man's urethra, opened and withdrawn. Yeah, that sounds not fun. I don't want that to happen. And then she talks about when she gets back from Singapore. Um, she didn't want to leave, but she was kind of ordered back. She says, I hated my job and was grief stricken about Singapore. I became a bore. All I could talk about was the Far East, which most other people had not seen and weren't interested in. There was an expression in the services to describe nostalgic, backward looking people. They were known as when eyes because they had nothing to say about the present or the future. They only talked about the past, when I was in Cyprus or when I was in Germany. I'd become a morose when I. Not wishing to remain one, I decided on further self improvement. And um, she basically took on a resettlement course and she says permission was given along with a rail warrant to get me to Aylesbury and details of how to find a place nearby named Missenden Abbey. I live near Aylesbury. She talks about when she read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I also borrowed Ernest Raymond's extraordinary and harrowing novel, We the Accused, the memory of which stayed with me for a very long time. And she says, on the 20th of July, 1969, two momentous things happened. My boyfriend and I sadly agreed to go our separate ways and man landed on the moon. Well, that'll make the breakup memorable, won't it? Uh, she fails the air crew selection test. I felt no surprise as I read the reason given. It seemed I lacked the necessary aptitude. And I wanna read this couple of paragraphs here because this is about her poem, I Wish I Looked After My Teeth, which is uh, one that my friend Michelle does a lot at open mic nights. If I had not joined the WRAF, I am sure I would have had none of my own teeth by this time. It had not been customary in our family to attend for routine dental checkups, and the dentist was still very much a figure to seek out in desperation when toothache was beyond endurance and extraction the only remaining option. In the WRAF, I had been made to attend for treatment, though I was so nervous that I was prescribed a sedative called Oblivion, which came in a turquoise egg-shaped gel capsule. This treatment, while I was stupefied, undoubtedly saved my hitherto neglected teeth. However, I still dreaded the visits. The high screaming whine of a drill deep in my molars was the stuff of nightmares. Despite this, once I was living in Whitney, I did have the sense to arrange regular dental checkups. 
During one of them, a tooth that needed filling was identified, an appointment was made for 6pm on a subsequent day. When that day arrived, I was cold with fear, watching the clock on Ernie Skinner's wall slowly count away the hours towards 6pm. I felt clammy and gripped by impending doom. Having no letters to write and no indulgences to crave, I began to doodle a verse or two about my fears, about my regret that I had not attached more importance to the well-being of my teeth when they were pearly and pristine. It began, oh, I wish I'd looked after me teeth. I arranged and rearranged it and finished it that afternoon. I liked it. It ridiculed a situation I was frightened of and made me feel a bit better about the ordeal to come. I learned it by heart and chucked it into the drawer at home where the component parts of my act were beginning to come together. Uh, and then we get, it covers when she um, was on Opportunity Knocks and ended up getting her poems on the radio and printing her own uh, chat books and all that kind of stuff which was a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, but also, I just want to share this one last bit about where she was living. Mrs. Harris was elated. As far as she was concerned, 94 High Street clearly had a kind of literary magic about it. For not only had her father-in-law, Mr. Ernest Harris, written his enchanting book, Wild Visitors to a Cotswold Garden, within its friendly walls, but a lady named Dora Saint had subsequently lived there too. Under the pen name of Miss Reed, she had written some of her highly successful Fairacre and Thrush Green novels, for which she was later awarded an OBE. Clearly, declared Mrs. Harris, the spell had been cast again, and I was the furtherance, the walking proof. So yeah. All in all, I did enjoy The Necessary Aptitude by Pam Ayres. I would give this a pretty solid four out of five. There was some really interesting stuff in it. Um, and just if you're um, into Pam Ayres' poetry or just want to know more about what England was like in the immediate uh, aftermath of the Second World War, definitely check it out. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Necessary Aptitude by Pam Ayres. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.